have your Bibles with you this morning, let me encourage you to turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Uh, this is a different, this is a transition in the scripture and uh, uh, I struggled this week, and let me say that. It's not with uh, the information. Uh, I preach expositorily, and, and what that means is I go verse by verse through a book of the Bible. Now, occasionally, I depart from that method, and uh, I'll bring a, a series of topical message, uh, messages such as we were talking about uh, bringing messages on uh, demons, and we brought a series on angels, and we did a series on the Holy Spirit. But by and large, I walk book by book, and we do that because we don't want to skip anything, and we do that because pastors, we have favorite verses, and we have favorite themes, and um, we would be tempted to always share our favorite themes over and over, and you'd hear them, and you hear them any, anyway because as you get to know me, I'm, you know, I'm the good news guy. I'm going to tell you good news. I, I don't believe in beating you up uh, with the gospel. And so um, I believe God's word will change hearts. But we're going to talk about from the mountaintop to a broken heart. We ended with Paul last week. Paul was on the mountaintop. Paul was the end of chapter 8. Paul was saying, what can separate us from the love of God? And he listed all the many things that were incapable, could not height, nor death, not principalities, not powers, not dominions. Nothing can, not life, not death, nothing could separate us from the love of God. That's great news. That is powerful news. And it's a reminder of no matter what you're facing in your life, no matter what you're going through, it's not more powerful than God. But as we come into chapter 9, uh, Paul's going to shift gears and we're going to enter a different... Um, a different series, and the book of Romans is, is really broken into three, uh, into three segments. And so this is, uh, uh, I, I borrowed this from J. Vernon McGee. I'm sure he won't mind uh, major themes. He breaks this thing down into uh, uh, about three different types. He says ver uh, chapters 1 through 8 were doctrinal. Chapters 9 through 11 are going to be dispensational. And, uh, and chapters 12 through 16 are going to be duty. He doesn't stop there. He says 1 through 8 is about faith. Uh, 11 or 9 through 11 is about hope. And 12 through 16 is about love. He says one more time, 1 through 8 was about salvation. And I hope you remember some of 1 through 8. 9 through 11 is going to be dealing with the nation of Israel. So he says it's about segregation. And then 12 through 16 is about separation. And so as you look at the uh, as you look at the book of Romans, 16 chapters involved, we're entering that midsection that where where Paul's dealing with the nation of Israel. Ironside says the uh, the nation of uh, speaking of the nation of Israel, he's going to deal in chapter 9 with God it's going to be God's past dealings with the nation of Israel. When we get to verse or chapter 10, and I'm, I'm not going to promise how long that's going to take me. I started out, I'm only going to make five verses today. Um, but chapter 10 is going to be God's present dealings with the nation of Israel. And then uh, chapter 11 is going to be God's future dealings with the nation of Israel. Now, you're already thinking in your mind, I'm not the nation of Israel. And that's where I struggled. Because I, uh, I really think everything that God has to say uh, speaks to our hearts and needs to speak to us and we're looking for practical application and how can I use this and none of us is interested in a history lesson. Well, almost none of us. I like history, but um, that's not what you're here for. You're here today to hear from God. You're here today to worship God. You're here today for God to answer the problems in your life. And so what we're going to do as we look at the nation of Israel, as we look at what Paul's going through and experiencing, we're going to relate those to the things that we encounter in our lives and what God would say to us in that same circumstance. So there's questions that are going to be answered about Israel's rejection. Has God abandoned the Jew? Now, we have people, and, and, and I encounter them every now and again, that are anti-Semitic. They're against Jews. They, uh, and, and they're all over the world, and it's not amazing. You can see them. There's, there's movements against them. There's organizations that, that work against them. But uh, God has not rejected the Jew. And so who is a true Israelite? Is there yet a role for Israel in God's plan? So it's God finished with them. 
Uh, if humans reject God, does God abandon his promises? Now, there's a good one, too. If you reject God, does, does God reject his promises? And can we thwart the sovereign will of God? Can we outmaneuver God? <laughs> I think you probably already know the answer to that. But if you don't, the answer is no, you cannot. You can't outmaneuver. You can't outguess. You can't be one step ahead of God. So we're going to talk about those things in the coming services as we go. But the first thing speaking about today is a joy dampened by sorrow. Paul ended chapter 8 with exuberance about the love of God and all that God had done and all that God's grace was capable of doing. But he enters chapter 9 and he says this, I tell you the truth or I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Now Paul is expressing a sincere and continual or perpetual sorrow or grief for the nation of Israel. The, Paul is a Jew. Paul said he was a Jew among Jews. Paul was, Paul was a member of of the Sanhedrin. Paul was a, was a person whose heart and soul had grown up in the teachings of the law in the nation of Israel. And so he begins with, with saying, I, of all the joy that I've got, of all the excitement that I've got, of all the exuberance that's in my heart, I'm never without sorrow when I think about my people, when I think about the nation of Israel. So he has a perpetual sorrow, perpetual grief. He has a personal connection. He said, I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Now, some people have conjectured, was he talking just hypothetically? You know, no. He, he sincerely meant he would trade his life for theirs if they would accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And have we seen that before? We have. We'll talk about that in just a moment. He had a paternal legacy. Who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. And so in these first four verses, Paul is sharing all of the things that the nation of Israel had to their benefit and all of the things that should have brought them to Christ and all of the things that they had neglected. And he's going to, over the next several weeks as we visit in this, he's going to talk about these in greater detail. But for this morning, I want to talk about the, 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 the context for us, for you and me. And the last of these was the prophetic reality of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. And some people question, does the Bible say that Jesus is God? Yes, it says it right here. Jesus is God. Jesus said, I am that I am. He claimed to be God and he was God. And Paul was reiterating that he was God. Not only was he God, but he was the Messiah. He was the chosen one. He was the one that the Jews had been waiting for. And they had forsaken. So Paul says, I, I, I'm, I'm perpetually disturbed. I'm perpetually in sorrow and in grief because my people won't accept the Lord Jesus Christ. They won't come to Jesus for their own. And so as we look at that, there's an identity that could not be surpassed. First of all, in verse, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22, he says of the adoption, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So God literally adopted Israel. Now that's a thing that you and I can relate to because the Bible tells us that we have been adopted and, and Paul visited in that in, in chapter 8. We're adopted, a wild olive branch grafted in. We've been adopted into the kingdom of God. But Paul says the nation of Israel was adopted by God and called by God to be his son. He said that they had the, the 
physical presence of God. If you remember in the Old Testament, with many occasions, uh, or many occasions, uh, the Spirit of God, as the children were in the wilderness, uh, uh, preceded them in a column of fire and a column of smoke. And, and the Shekinah glory of God uh, rested upon Moses as he came down uh, from the mount. And, and, and when he would come out of the Holy of Holies, the Shekinah glory rested between the Ark of the Covenant. And so the children of Israel had that, that divine presence, the glory of God in their midst. They had the covenants. All of the, uh, the you know, he said, a new covenant I've given to you. All of, the prom- all of the covenants of the scripture were for the nation of Israel. And Paul is saying, look, here is all of the things that God did for you. Here are all of the things that God laid out for you. And how is it that you can forsake him? They had the law, and in Galatians, Paul tells us that the law was a tutor. It was designed to point out the holiness of God and the righteousness of God. It was to show us that we would never be good enough to make it to heaven that we needed a sacrifice, and Jesus Christ would be that eternal sacrifice. He said they had the service of God. God called and appointed priest in the tabernacle and in the temple and, and, and set out the tribe of Levi to, to serve and to give uh, the offerings for Christ and to give the sacrifices for Christ perpetually. Paul, uh, I mean, Christ set up, or God set up for the nation of Israel... A, a clearly demonstrated illustration of his power and his, and his presence. They had all of the promises. God, Abraham, I'll, I'll give you the seed. They'll be more countless than the sand. They'll be more countless than the stars in heaven. Every, you will be, you will be my people. And they had the fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And so when Paul looks at this first five verses, Paul is saying to them, I, my, I'm tore up inside. I'm grieved inside because of all of these things that are out there, all of these things that God has done for you. And I remind you of this, and we're going to get into some difficult areas as we go on through uh, verse 9, but the, the nation of Israel was not ignorant of who Jesus Christ was. Um, when, when, when the wise men came together and said, where will Jesus be born? They said, in Bethlehem, the city of David. There was no mystery. They knew all the signs were there. The presence was there. We told you as we studied in, in Daniel, the timing was right for Jesus Christ to appear. If they had listened to the prophets, they knew the timing was right. They had all of the indications there. And Jesus came working miracles up to and including raising the dead, healing the blind, curing the leopard, uh, making the lame to walk. They had all of the signs. And they said, we must find a way to get rid of him. Because if we don't, then all of Israel will follow him and we'll lose our place, we'll lose our standing, and Rome will attack. And they went so far as to say, and, and they didn't understand, they didn't, re, they didn't realize what they, they were saying, but they went, they went so far as to say it was better that one should die for the nation. And, and that, was a profe- yeah, that was the high priest that said that, by the way. And that was a prophecy that Jesus Christ would die, one dying, the sacrifice, Romans chapter 5, one dying for the sins of all men, for one time. But they had an identity that the, the nation of Israel had the greatest identity possible. And I remind you, Jesus was a Jew. And Paul is a Jew. And Paul, although he would become the minister to the Gentile nation, Paul had a heart and a burning longing for the nation of Israel to accept him. And of course, the Messiah. So, Paul had a love deeper than self. I like this. We talked about this this morning in our Sunday school lesson. Exodus chapter 32. says, Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, 
I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. Now, what I want to say to you this morning about that, as we're praying for the people who have offended us, as we are seeking God's will for the people who have offended us, we need a heart like Paul and a heart like Moses. A love that is deeper than ourselves. I can't imagine, I can't, I can, I can only imagine this for one of my children, to be honest with you. Uh, but this is a love. Paul is saying, I would give myself if you would, if, if you would redeem the nation of Israel. If they, would come to the, if they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now let me hasten to say, some did, and some continue to. Uh, uh, and so it was, it, the, whole, uh, the whole nation of Israel has not been forsaken because there have been Jews who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But Paul had a love that went beyond his own self, so much so that he was willing to sacrifice himself to see a loved one, to see his brothers and sisters come, come to know Jesus Christ. And uh, when I hear that, that's a bit of an, an indictment sometimes. Because sometimes what do we do? We get frustrated with loved ones. We get aggravated with people who don't get it. We get aggrav aggravated with those people who are trying uh, to go against us, who are, are opposing us. And so I challenge you this morning as I challenge myself, when we look about or when we look upon the lost, that we have the heart of Paul or we have the heart of Moses, that we have a heart that is grieved by their unwillingness to accept Christ, not repelled, not angry, not here. Hey, here's 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 the attitude we sometimes get. Well, let them go to hell, folks. You don't know how bad hell is, and and the Bible tells us we, we can't imagine what's in heaven, and, and 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 I'm thankful for that. But it just what we know about hell is a terrible picture. The worm does not die. That the 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 fire is not quenched. Perpetual gnawing of the teeth, grinding. It's a bad place. It's real too, by the way. It's not metaphorical. It's not, it's not hypothetical. It's a real place. And so we ought to be grieved that somebody is going there. We ought to be stirred within our hearts to action, to witness, and to tell people, and to try to, 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 to wrestle them, if we could, from the gates of hell. And sometimes we think, well, you know, pull up the ladder, I'm on board. Well, you know, I told them, that's all I, that's, that's my part, I'm done. But Paul had a perpetual sorrow for his people because they weren't hearing them. Paul had a love deeper than self. He had a love deeper than his circumstances. In Acts chapter 23, verse 12, not only was Paul grieved, not only was Paul concerned for his people, his people hated him. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. <laughs> that puts a new spin on that pray for those who despitefully use you, doesn't it? Can you pray for people that are trying to kill you? You see, Paul had a, Paul had a genuine biblical worldview. Paul, wanted, Paul knew God's promises. Paul knew God's covenants. Paul... Paul knew the Messiah. Paul knew all these things were provisions made for the nation of Israel. Paul knew ultimately God was going to redeem them. And Paul, Paul desperately wanted them to get it. But they didn't see it. And so sometimes in our lives, we know all about heaven. And we know enough about hell. And we want our loved ones to miss it. But our loved ones don't want to hear it. And maybe they get angry with you. Maybe they yell at you. Maybe they, maybe they tell you, hey, don't, don't bring that to my house. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear about your Jesus anymore. Well, I, I, want you to, I want you to reflect upon Paul's heart again. He had a love deeper than himself, and he had a love deeper than his circumstances. He knew, he knew that they hated him, yet it didn't stop his love for them. It didn't stop his desire I, don't, I believe Paul went to his grave 
grieving the nation of Israel and hoping and, and longing for their redemption. Boy, to love deeper than distractions. I like what Spurgeon said. He said, get love for the souls of men, then you will not be whining about a dead dog, a sick cat, or about a, the crotchets of a family and the little disturbances that John and Mary may make of their idle talk. You will be delivered from petty worries, if I need not further describe them, if you're concerned about the souls of men. Get your soul full of great grief, and your little griefs will be driven out. That's convicting for me. That's the challenge. Paul reminds us that we're not burdened enough in our day and age for the lost. We need, we need to recognize that God died for everybody. And just as Paul recognized that God, the Messiah, came for the nation of Israel, he was the promise, he was the climax of the promises. He was, he was the epitome of what they had hoped for, and they missed it. And we need to have that same burning uh, passion to tell the lost about Jesus Christ. And we sit back sometimes, and we say, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm saved, and I'm glad I, I got it. And I wish old Bill or Mary or Tom or Sue or John or whoever, I wish they would get it. But if they don't, well, feel sorry for them. Well, are you praying for them? Are you grieved for them? Are you mourning for them? Are you fasting for them? Are you, are you spending the time in prayer for them that you ought to? And, and I, this is what Paul reminds me as I looked at these five verses. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me. We ought to have the love that Paul had for the, for, the, for the nation of Israel for our purpose, for our church, for our nation. So Paul had a love duplicating that of our Savior. W.H. Griffin Thomas said this, Paul had a spark from the fire of Christ's substitutionary love. Now what did Jesus say he did? But God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. You see, Jesus didn't wait for you to get your act together. Jesus didn't wait for you to clean up all your nasty spots. Jesus didn't wait for you to reach sinless perfection and say, well, then now you're worthy of redemption. Jesus said, I see you for everything you are. And he's told us even at our very best, what? Our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good, he said. We cannot be good enough to earn our way into heaven. And Paul, Paul, he, he had a glimpse of what Jesus felt. And he said, let me die for them. If you just let me die for them, I would do that. And of course he couldn't. But Jesus died for them. And Jesus made the provision even for those who hated him. You realize that the grace of God is sufficient to save absolutely everyone that's ever lived. It is inexhaustible in its power. But we have to choose to be saved. We have to choose to accept the gift of God. And so, lessons that cannot be ignored. First of all, our relationship with Christ is not of national heritage. You're not a Christian today because you're an American. And we used to say we are a Christian nation and our currency still says in God we trust, but we don't and we aren't. And we are increasingly becoming less a Christian nation and more a pagan nation and we'll reap the consequences for those terrible decisions. But there are people out there that say, well, we're, I live in a Christian nation. I'm a Christian because I live in a... No, you're not. Your national heritage won't get you to heaven. Being born in America or in the South or in the Bible Belt won't get you to heaven. Your relationship's not a denominational heritage. You can be a Southern Baptist. You can be a member of a Southern Baptist church and not know Jesus. Now that shouldn't happen, by the way. 
That shouldn't happen. We pray for children coming up in the VBS, and it's my prayer that, that some will come to know Jesus Christ. But we fear sometimes because one comes down and a friend comes down and a friend comes down and a friend comes down before you know you've got four coming down and there's one that's sincere and three that are following. And we don't know. We're not the judge of that and God's the judge of that. But we're careful that we're clear about what the gospel message is and it's a personal commitment to Christ. It's not a commitment to church membership. It's not a commitment to, to denominational membership. It's not something we did because our friend did. It's something we did because we were convicted of our personal sins because God shined the light of the glory of Christ on our spiritual condition and let us know that we were lost and undone and we needed a Savior. And we said, Lord, I hear you. I, 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 forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. And he'll do that. He's still doing that today, by the way. So it's not about, just as it was with the nation of Israel, they're, they're, uh, uh, he's going to go on and elaborate this later in chapter 9, but their national heritage, the fact that they were the seed of Abraham, did not guarantee them God's blessing. And the fact that they were Jews did not guarantee them God's blessings. Paul's going to talk about later what is a Jew. So our relationship's not familiar heritage. Some of you have got godly parents. That won't get you into heaven either. It's a good start. Because <laughs> godly parents brought you to church. Godly parents brought you up in the love and admonition of the Lord. Godly parents taught you about the word of God. Godly parents taught you how to pray. Godly parents instilled in you the love of Christ. But your godly parents won't get you to heaven either. And so if you're counting on mom and daddy, you're not going to make it. It's a personal commitment. Each and every one of us has to make that personal choice to follow Jesus. Godly parents or grandparents won't do it. Now, I'm thankful for godly parents. I'm thankful for godly grandparents. I'm thankful that we bring our kids and we bring our grandkids into the house of God. Because Hey, let me tell you this too. God still saves young people more than old people. It's not that God can't save old people. It's as we get older, we get set in our ways. We get hard-headed. We get resolved. The young heart is still pliable. The, the young heart is still, uh, is still open more to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so pray for VBS. Pray that God would reach these young people. And I've told you, I'm praying for young people. I'm praying for God to call young people into full-time ministry. And I believe, I, listen, I, I plan to go on the mission field again in 2024. I'd love to see some young people join me. I'm sure we can slice off another piece of cat or, or, or <laughs> python. We can get plenty for you. We got plenty of snails. Um, you don't have to eat that if you go. I eat, you know, I eat what's put before. I want to experience things. I, I want to go through. I want to experience things that you can't experience anywhere else. And so I do that. Uh, but you don't have to do that. You can go over there and you can, you can, the Lord can touch you and you can have a good time in the Lord and you can eat, you know, saltine cracker, whatever they got that you brought with you. Um, and there's people that do that. They bring packs full of Reese's cup, cup, I mean, um, um, what's the little orange crackers? Uh, yeah, cheese crackers, thank you. Bring with them. So our relationship's not familiar. Hey, we can have all the blessings in sight and choose to reject God's plan. Folks, I can't imagine you came up at First Broad Baptist Church and you didn't hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you could have been brought up right here. You could have heard evangelists and good preachers and singing and all the great things that we have here. Just like the nation of Israel got the covenants and the promises and the fathers and, and the glory and the adoption and all the things that they got and they still rejected God. That can happen to you. It's a personal choice. And one of the things pastors fear is that we will, that we will fail to communicate adequately that God's love is a personal thing. And we're going to talk about later in chapter 9, election. And that's a, that's a tough topic. Uh, to discuss, but we're going we're gonna to go there. And that's, again, that's the reason we go up expositorily. You can't skip over the parts that are difficult or that you don't like. 
uh, you have to cover it verse by verse. So that's what we do. All right. It's a personal decision. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 8 through 9. This is, uh, this is our invitation. This is uh, my testimony that God is making this personal to you. This is, this is Paul's testimony that this is a personal decision. If you will believe in your heart, if you will confess with your lips, you shall be saved. I can't be saved for you. I can't be baptized for you as some church teaches. I, I, I can't do... I can, I can tell you about God all day long, but I can't save you. Only God can. And so... I hope this morning that I've adequately communicated Paul's sorrow was that all of this was made available to the nation of Israel and they rejected him. And a pastor's sorrow is that all of this is made available to us and do we miss it? And, and, and do we neglect it or do we take it for granted? And so I would say to you this morning as our musicians come for our invitation... I, I, I don't know what God's doing in your personal life. I don't know what God's challenging you to do. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, but God knows. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, then listen, don't, don't wait. We don't have any promise of tomorrow or even today. People slip out into eternity without any warning whatsoever. Today is the day of salvation. If you're here today and you're saved, you don't doubt that you're saved whatsoever, but, but you've not had a genuine burden for the lost. Not even your own family. I mean, you, you prayed for them, but you haven't fasted, you haven't mourned, you haven't, you haven't grieved. Then maybe you need to do that for someone that you love. Maybe it's somebody who's offended you. They've been angry. They've been mean to you. They, they, they've mistreated you. Maybe God's calling on you. It's time for reconciliation. It's time, it's time for you to love them. It's time for you to demonstrate the love of God as only you can. Have the grief of Paul, the grief of Moses, and let the Lord do a work in your life. That's our prayer.